It's time for the Access of Easy podcast, the weekly technology digest that keeps you ahead of the curve. Brought to you by EasyDNS.com. Welcome back, everybody, to the Axis of Easy podcast. This is number 359. My name is Joey. That's Len. Len, Trump speaking at the RNC con- the, the convention tonight, the Republican cringe vention, as I've been calling it on Twitter. Um, you going to tune in? I mean, it's late on Thursday night right now. He probably speaks in like an hour or so. So you, what do you think? You going to watch? Maybe. Did Hogan speak yet? He hasn't. I understand Kid Rock was there too. <laughs> Linda McMahon was supposed to be there as well. No, come on. Mm-hmm. Is it what is it, Raw? Or is it <laughs> Well, the other side has Kamala, so you know oh, true. Right. He was also there was also a wrestler called Kamala back in the eighties. <laughs> so right, that's why Hogan is there. I don't know what's going on, but you know what? Uh, I want to tune in for Trump. Yeah. That your thing. He's gonna take the band-aid uh, off during the speech. That's my bet. You think so? Yeah, I bet you it's a nice a nice wound. I bet you it's started to close up or it's been stitched up. It's been what four or five days now. Let's see. I th- I think he t- I think he takes it off during the speech. It'd be legendary. If he did it, or if he had it off for the next debate, one or the other. Where's it? Like, where's the most impact? Maybe the next debate. Who's he debating? Apparently, Biden <laughs> is being asked to step down on Sunday. Yes, that's what I see. That's... So. <laughs> it, like, him and Kamala would be good. Trump is a lot of things, but eloquent is not one of them. And so watching those two debate would be like nails on a chalkboard, I think. So then does the speaker, like who's then the number three? Because what happened? So, okay, we can go back in time. Nixon, yeah, Spiro Agnew left before Nixon, but then Gerald Ford was the speaker of the house, I think. Was so it? then when Nixon resigned, uh, Gerald Ford was elevated yeah. to be. So then who is his vice president? He, I guess he didn't have one when he was president under his do first you, term. Do you need one if you're appointed late in the term? What happens if some, you know, you have to have a contingency plan, right? Is it the other party's like I, leader, I when, like the minority leader or majority leader, I guess? I don't know. Man, I don't know. They got to go back in time. This what the heck happened in 1971 and it's all around that time but the, right? other, but the other thing the other thing <laughs> then, yeah <laughs> watergate anyway. Now, either way I, i'm curious to see what happens it, like how it's going to transpire moving forward and if they biden does do it like does he actually know what he's saying no and i i'm i'm seeing here that uh tucker is on now at their rnc so i mean it's a who's who of like sort of cringy public figures. I like Tucker. I shouldn't say he's a cringy public figure, but um, the other stuff I've seen, you know. Kid Rock? Hulk Hogan Kid Rock, I think, is kind of cringy. Hulk, I don't know. I haven't seen, like, what kind of public speaking chops does Hulk Hogan have? Is he empowered by Jesse Ventura's career pipeline? Is that what's happening here? Uh, Ventura was, you know, a mayor, governor, and yeah. a, a perennial candidate that's going to, oh, sorry, a perennial uh, maybe candidate for the Libertarian Party, it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Always a name that's being bantied around. Eh, I want to interview him. It'd be fun to interview that guy. Yeah, let's bring him on. Um, let's do it. Okay, so we got uh, the usual stuff here. Last week's quote we'll start with. Nothing can stop the man with the right mental attitude from achieving his goal. Nothing on earth can help the man with the wrong mental attitude. That was by Thomas Jefferson. And Ben was the winner. Good job, Ben. Nice job. Uh, this week's quote. Socialism of any type and shade leads to a total destruction of the human spirit. And to a leveling of mankind into death. If you know who that was by, that cheery quote, that real uplifting banger of a quote, put in the comment section. No Googling. Don't look it up unless it's in your uh, set of encyclopedias purchased, you know, sometime around 1985 or 1990 from a porch salesman. Uh, and you get your next round of renewals on Easy DNS. Can't beat that. Freebie. Take it. You know, if you know who it was by, throw it in the comments. You have to be first. Don't forget. Uh, okay, Len, so we got tonight one, two, three, four, five stories. Some follow-ups, some new stuff, and uh, OpenAI making another appearance, of course. Where do you want to start? Uh, Google. Some messed up uh, news coming from the world of AI. So Google recently filed for an AI-powered design to a system design to 
automatically detect objectionable video content. And people are questioning, is this... I mean, okay, a- listen. We talk on our show. Some of the stories you read, especially in the back hour, are nuts. And I'm always impressed on how you generally keep a straight face. This is in the same category, I think. Like, we got the open... We got the automated tool to review questionable videos. Len, come on. Come on. Yeah, well, I'm trying to. This is going to be posted on YouTube, so I understand. <laughs> trying to bow to my overlords, our overlords for the time being. So <laughs> people are questioning: Is this tool nearly, nearly sorry, really necessary? Let's be honest, because okay, it's one thing. There's a growing volume of AI generated content that's online. You go on YouTube, you go on Twitter, you go on anywhere, you could see it. But it's possible that this new development, this new type of system that's being developed by Google can be used as a way to increase censorship and surveillance by these big tech companies. And the core of Google's proposed system it is utilization of machine learning. And it's also u- using artificial neural networks. And so just like the human brain, these neural networks would be trained to analyze video data on a pixel by pixel da- basis. And the analysis would then be used to create what they call quote unquote embeddings. So essentially, these these are like digital fingerprints that represent the content and its metadata. And by comparing these footprint, these fingerprints, sorry, to a vast database of known questionable content, well, then the system could flag something as problematic and potentially as something that could be removed. So currently, YouTube requires users, or I think it's now a requirement, requires us- users to identify if their content is AI generated or not. So by moderating this, it's very difficult right now because the sheer volume of amount of videos being uploaded, very difficult for them to actually look at this and monitor it correctly. So this solution promises at least a way to expedite the process to automatically identify if something has potentially flagged comments and, or sorry, videos. And this could also allow for faster moderation. So that's the positive side, but the concerns, well, Misidentification is one. Um, then the subjectivity of what constitutes of, as objectable comment uh, content. So, who's the overlord here? Well, it's Google slash YouTube. So th- this kind of raises some concerns. And you know, we have a system that potentially may be trained on a data set, but it could erroneously flag something as harmful. And what happens? Well, the content creator gets hurt. The end user gets less data that they could see, less videos they could see. So ultimately it could hurt a lot more than it could help. But I understand what they're trying to do, what they're trying to achieve because the advent of AI and the amount of videos that are AI generated, it is humongous. And often, Joey, when I see a video that's posted on Twitter and it's funny, I question, is it AI generated? Always, yeah. So if we're questioning this, man, it makes me wonder, hopefully other people are doing the same, because they could easily be duped by a message from a prominent individual telling them to do something like Michael Saylor, for instance. But yeah, what are your thoughts on this? I think that the likelihood this goes well from the same company who brought you, you know, picture after picture of the founding fathers, except they were all black. It's pretty low. You know, I I don't think they're going to get this right. I'm concerned about the timing. You know, we spoke just the beginning of the show here about the RNC being tonight. The White House obviously made the false claim, you know, it was an out, an outright lie, completely made up on their part, that the Biden stumbling, bumbling, grumbling videos were deep fakes, cheap fakes, I think was the word they used. But, um, you know, the election's around the corner, so the timing bothers me. And also then, like, I, again, like, not to sort of beat a dead horse here, but when has any attempt controlling content been a net positive on the environment in which the content is posted never and it just gives like this idea that ai or it's automatic or machine learning whatever the buzzword is isn't it really just another layer of protection from the people who are actually making the decisions oh we didn't do it the algorithm did it we have to keep training it we need more data we need more whatever it really just like dilutes accountability that's a thing that really bothers me and we've seen this a bunch from the big platforms over the last 10 or so years, why not more of it? You know, AI at its core 
is this sort of, uh, you know, nebulous thing that nobody takes responsibility for in the, at the end of the day. Oh, it's training off this data, that data, it's scraping the web, it's doing X, Y, Z. You know, Google should be responsible for this stuff that they mess up, muck up, uh, whether it was the, you know, black founding fathers or uh, whether it's the stuff that comes from this in a year um, or less than a year, I guess. It's, uh, you know, only a few months away now. Time's flying here before the election. I expect to see this politicized. Don't you? I mean, isn't that the sort of the the rational expectation at this point from any thinking person? Well, let's look at this from a different point of view. I'm not trying to justify this, but from Google's point of view, they're the ones that are administering YouTube mm -hmm. and people are uploading videos, whatever it may be on their platform. So not only could they do what they want, but they have the obligation to ensure that their users aren't being fed content that may yeah, yeah. misdirect there so For sure. by using this and i'm not trying to justify this but i'm just you know trying to devil's advocate here if anything this is going to flag stuff that may have not been flagged before so it would potentially delete more stuff that should would would have probably passed muster today and in that case you probably have more people likely not be subjected to crappy ai suggestions mm -hmm. and so in, in their eyes they're, they're saying they're doing their level best to protect their their users and um it's going to appease shareholders and regulators and so forth that's devil's advocate do i agree with it but i probably not but i could see them using that as an argument they might but i, I mean neither of us buy it and i don't think anyone else should buy it either you know what's the best indicator of uh future behavior it's it's past behavior and uh, these guys clearly have an axe to grind, and I expect them to, you know, really get to grinding anytime here. Kaspersky, we talked Again. about Kaspersky. Yeah, Again. yeah. It's a follow-up to that story. Yeah, yeah. It looks like they're in the U.S. market no more because, as you just touched on a second ago, that the U.S. government imposed a ban on Kaspersky products and services, and they were citing national security as one of the concerns and why they went ahead with this type of of kicking them out but the u.s government they allege that kaspersky has ties to the russian government and as i mentioned that could be potentially a national security threat and they believe that they can be pressured to steal u.s data or install malware at the behest of the russian government so russian government says you know what let's do this and kaspersky says okay why not because we're mm -hmm. buddy buddies but of course kaspersky is they're denying all these allegations and they maintain they're purely a commercial company so they say that the u.s government's decision was politically motivated and driven this is driven by the current geopolitical environment between russia and the west but let's be honest all decisions are politically motivated and name me one that isn't this yeah. is the reality so great point uh, the company argues that their products are used by millions of customers around the world and even u.s government agencies are using their products so their record their track record speaks for itself that should have some bearing but it doesn't unfortunately so ultimately this move is going to do nothing to help out the russian united states relations which is pretty sour these days and it's only going to get worse after this but either way the departure of this it leaves a gap in the market of available security solutions something is going to have to fill that void and hopefully it it is product that is secure mature and able to do the job that they wanted to do because if not this could cause some real problems moving forward if not see you next week on access of easy <laughs> for your data breach debut <laughs> hey len Kaspersky's been around since I was like, I don't know, at least 18. Like, you know, I, I, I've been looking at antivirus options for different laptops and home computers and different needs for past employers or myself or my family for a long time. And there's always like two or three names right at the top, you know, NOD32 from ESET and Kaspersky antivirus from, uh, from Kaspersky. I, I don't. I don't know that we've had over the last year or so of doing this show any stories about Kaspersky that weren't them diagnosing and addressing a security issue with someone else's system. And here we are, the US government deciding, of course, political, as you mentioned, that the company can no longer operate, you know, in their jurisdiction. What are we talking about here? You know, how many 
how many government hospitals, um, other government agencies have been compromised and discussed on this show with no heads rolling. Microsoft probably continues to administer 90% of those, uh, those, those network systems. And Kaspersky has to leave the U S because, you know, I suspect it's some mix of, it looks nice to ban a Russian company and they're too good as far as a product uh, to compete against at this point. It sucks. Who suffers as always, Len, with situations like this? The user, the little guy. And uh, now, they, as you mentioned, they'll be forced to, in some cases, find uh, a quick-ish replacement, especially in a bigger network system, a quick-ish replacement for the uh, purpose Kaspersky was serving. The likelihood they're able to do that, you know, I don't know, probably not as high as it should be. And probably the risk is greater than uh, was necessary, but everyone bows to uh, political whims at the end of the day. It's a, you know, it's a problem with the system we're in right now. And, uh, you know, overall, it may be a minor side effect, but um, still to a lot of people, this is going to be a, a huge pain in the neck. Do you think that there's going to be people in Russia reporting on stuff that Kaspersky is reporting on? Like our counterparts over there, the axis of, West Eastern easy, <laughs> right? Like they're out there, they're reporting because they're going to get a lot of information from Kaspersky because they still operate there. Here we yeah. don't. We, like every once in a while we got, like you, you touched on it, we get information from them for it. Yeah. It's, it's the basis of our, our story, but not anymore moving forward. So them, they'll be able to get those stories. Us. It's a disaster. Yeah. It's, it's a disaster. It's like over and over again, you see these. And that I, just to reiterate, the thing that pains me the most is that you and me are in the know enough, I think, thanks to this show and thanks to Bitcoin, that we'll still find out about a lot of the vulnerabilities that are sort of being exposed around the world. But what about the average person? What about the guy who you know has a family computer at home and wants to make sure his kids aren't downloading stuff that you know ruin his family photo collection or or turf his tower in some other way? Now he's got to switch to something that maybe he doesn't trust as much, he doesn't like as much, he's not as familiar with. It sucks, you know, and. Uh, the fact that it's, you know, at least half political, just it's, it reeks to high hell. It's too bad. Honestly, it's mm -hmm. just too bad. Zero Hedge is reporting that AT&T suffered a data breach. And that's where hackers gained access to a cloud platform. And they were able to steal customer data, including calls and text message records. So if you're an AT&T customer and wondering the time frame that was impacted, well, it started around May 1st, 2022 to somewhere between October 31st, 2022 and January 3rd, 2023. So it's quite a, an interesting time frame. So this is an indication that the breach might have happened multiple times or the attackers were able to access the data over a continuous period of time. The good news for all this, if you take a silver lining here, is that the stolen data probably does not include sensitive information like social security numbers, but it does include telephone numbers, dates of call, texts, and anybody that has info like this, they could use that information against somebody if they notice a pattern of calls or something like that, or they get access to the text messages. They could certainly cause some harm to an individual, but I don't think many people do use text messages these days. So I think for the most part, they're secure there just because... I think, I think a lot of people use text messages. <sighs> too bad. <laughs> like, why? I think, yeah, I think a lot of people do. Yeah. Well, anyway... AT&T, they are doing their part. They're investigating the matter. And something to note, this is the second breach that they've been impacted. In this year. So yeah. Of the year. yeah. So the people out there, they should have concerns, legitimate concerns about the security of the customer data if you are a customer of AT&T. So AT&T customers should be on the lookout for any unsolicited calls or text messages that they receive because... Somebody probably has access, again, like I mentioned, to your telephone number, your history of calls, your text messages. Also, it may be worthwhile to consider changing the pins to your voicemail, passwords associated to the AT&T accounts, and so forth. What an absolute mess. I don't know how big AT&T is in terms of the market share. I guess they're one of the biggest in the United States. Actually, what is their stock? Have you taken a look at their stock price? There's no there's no point because no one cares about these stories anymore. Like, they... they the the title, you didn't mention the title of the article, but the title is that AT&T reveals hackers stole, quote, nearly all records of customer calls and texts. 42% in the year, they are up. The last nice. week, they're up 2%. So this news hasn't done much in the past 
little while, but over the grand scheme of things, they've been up quite a bit. Five years, they're down 22%. It's just all the data. I mean, who really cares? The best part about this land, again, my my um, you know uh, pain point for most of these stories, the data <laughs> that was stolen, customer call and text interactions occurred between May 1st and October 31st, 2022, as well as on January 2nd, 2023, more than a year ago. And here we are a year later, finally, dis the disclosure. Hopefully, you didn't get sucked into any scams in that last year, text message user, uh, because AT&T refused to tell you that something was going on. Just, just got, I don't want to you know, expand the state, but like, how is there not laws against that? You, gotta, you wait a year until the, you disclose the breach to your customers? A year. That's, it's inexcusable. It's unacceptable. It, it should be illegal. And the people that use text messages, I think, especially those who use them often, you know, Len, they're they're probably some of the most vulnerable pe vulnerable people in, as as far as like the uh, percentage of customer base, right? You gotta think it's people who don't have WhatsApp, don't have Signal, don't have Telegram, uh, don't worry about uh, encryption, don't worry about sending files or photos. It's that's the that is the honeypot you want, honestly. And uh, even if you don't use text messages, you call people on your phone. You know, you maybe got picked off anyways like you know i i it, what else can you say about this except that it's like shameful that these guys don't report this stuff earlier but without being forced i mean why would they it's really the there's, there's no there's no ethical dilemma here you know the only reason they report is because they have to and uh when they have to they they're a year late people should look for alternatives yeah absolutely right like customer, i totally agree right? Right? two t-mobile is sitting there yeah waiting for people to and they also mine for polka dots, so you might get a airdrop of that <laughs> as well. So, anyways, there's, there's a new tactic that's being used by attackers out there, and it's to bypass something called a secure email gateway (SEGs). I've never heard about these SEGs before. This story, so it, it was interesting to learn about them. So, SEGs are supposed to protect users from malicious emails. But attackers are now encoding malicious URLs in a way that could bypass those SEG checks. And how these SEG these systems work is by scanning emails for content before they reach the recipient's inbox. But there's some SEGs that trust other SEG encoded <laughs> URLs. Don't trust. Oh, verify. boy. <laughs> so all this means is that an attacker can encode a malicious URL within another URL that has already been scanned by a different SEG. In that case, then the recipient SEG may not scan for the encoded URL again. So all this does is allow for the attacker to put a URL, a malicious URL that could bypass the SEG's defense and it will reach the recipient's inbox. So the question comes up, how can you protect yourself against this tactic? Well, just like everything else, you have to have the best defense is awareness and training. So for the end user, don't click on links in emails. Even if it looks legitimate, be very skeptical before you start clicking on something. But on top of that increased awareness, organizations too need to step up their, their game to protect themselves and their customers from this tactic. And this includes keeping SEG software up to date and using SEGs that are configured to scan all URLs, regardless of whether they are encoded or not. How, Over to you. How close are we getting to broad instructions at, at a corporate level to never click links to stuff. The reason I ask is because you know what I'm starting to notice even in places like YouTube and Twitter now? I see this when we do our video, when we post our YouTube videos on the other channel. You notice that Discord uh, and YouTube have some kind of, uh, I would guess it's it's some kind of sister software to this SEG thing where it actually changes to like a native Discord link in the description of the videos. Have you noticed that? No. So when we put the Discord invite link in, it actually changes to a little Discord text and a Discord logo. YouTube does that on the back end. And if I think about my own sort of corporate setting, when I receive a file that's a Teams file, it's, it's it looks a certain way and it has the Teams logo next to it. It looks different than a, an, ex, an external link. Mm -hmm. And it's I think this is going to continue to be the practice. Because I look at stories like this and I see that we talk a lot, even about like simple kind of link clicking stories that end up in phishing attacks and whatnot. The, like th this is the future of these applications is backend harmony between different 
product suites. So whether it's Gmail and Discord or you know, easy DNS and Twitter or whatever, there's going to be some kind of backend work that goes on to make sure these things are properly vetted. And the fact of the matter is if your platform won't play along, no one will use your platform. There's good and bad to that, of course, but I think that this is the way things are going to go. I don't, I don't know too much about this, as you mentioned, even before reading the story, but to me, the, the thing that makes the most sense is that we come to some agreement on, on what these things should look like in communications. And it seems like we're starting, but we're not all the way there yet. Do you ever click on a link in your work environment that is not from your work? No. no. The other thing I notice all the time too is uh, when I get invites for like Teams permissions or whatever, it's, it also sends a, um, what would you call it? I think it's called a native notification. So when someone sends me a Teams link in an email, I get notified in the Teams app. It's not just in my email. So again, like another sort of uh, harmonious instance, right? Where like two things are working together to show you that something is legit. We actually talked a bit about this in another way with the phones and the face scans a little while ago. These sort of like two-factor, you know, pseudo two-factor, let's say, authentication techniques. Like you need your phone and your face to get into your banking app, for example, right? Your face on a new phone won't do it. You have to align those things and like the token has to work together. You're going to see this more and more everywhere. One, because it's becoming just more pre more prevalent software, but two, because the security threats are becoming more prevalent as well. And so I think this is the direction you're going to see this stuff go. I think it's a good idea, but I'm not smart enough to know on the back end why it might not be. I'm sure that there's reasons why you don't want to do that, but for now, seems to be the most logical place to go next. Open AI will finish this episode with Sam open. and the gang. Sam and the gang up up to no good. <laughs> I, I won't be long in this one because open AI, <laughs> they take safety seriously. Remember that. <laughs> this is a message we're getting from them. Mark, so uh, the Len, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Neither. Safety comes first always, Len. Always of course. safety. Okay. Of Never course. anything else but safety. Well, I feel secure now knowing I read this because apparently they developed a new system and what it does, what's this new system is there's two AI models, two different AI models that talk to each other. And the idea behind this is that the more powerful model will be more transparent and easier for humans to understand. So the current model is working on this. So they're currently working on a model that is working on simple math. Mm -hmm. And with that, it's trying to explain its reasoning for coming up with the answer. And the AI is talking to another AI that is trained to determine if the answer is right or wrong. The question is who programmed this to determine if things are right and wrong. You're always going to have some sort of bias. They, they say they want to be more transparent in their approach. But without the ability to look and analyze the code, it's very difficult to take this at face value because there's been numerous instances as to why the information people are getting is not safe and secure you don't know what it is it's just it's a biased type of system so what i'm trying to get at I, I mentioned i want to be brief and i really want to stick to that is that you can't analyze anything you're just trusting oh. them for what they're saying somebody programs it and is they say that they're doing it in this particular way without an ability to analyze if that's truth or there's truth behind that or not you have to take their word but their word has been stepped on so many times it's been trashed it's been tarnished that means nothing to me so Sam and buddies, you know, they could just kick rocks. It's garbage. I, I totally agree. I'm not going to add much else. I think Altman and the team over there have proven to be bad actors already a couple of times. I expect it to continue on the back end of this or on the sort of, uh, you know, behind on, in terms of like what's going on behind the scenes, tons of stories about how these guys are trying to pull the ladder up on AI vis-a-vis -vis regulation. If you think about how regulators view quote unquote safety, it just means preserving their points of view while, while silencing others. This has been the case for at least the last 10 or 12 years. It's probably been the case even before that. Thankfully, there are other places where we can get stories on stuff like this now. And this one is behind an archive. So if you go to the link, make sure you use archive.is. But uh, the, the point is that, you know, you said it best. You're, you've already been proven to be fraudulent, you know, in terms of what you mean by safety and, and things of this nature. Uh, you know, believe it at your own risk. Find your own way to get this data. Find your own way to do the research. AI is not a panacea. People who go to AI and are like, oh, I found this recipe. Oh, I found this thing on history. Oh, I found this. Like, that's not enough to 
to, to give up what you're giving up by letting these guys dictate to you this sort of terms of engagement. And you have to realize that if you don't, then you're going to watch, you know, this is like a little bit hyperbolic, but like you're going to watch history die right in front of you in favor of whatever the current narrative is. And you've seen it a bunch already, you know? These guys, the, the data that they're using is not good. The the stories that they use as far as like the LLM, they're not, it's none of it is good, man. If you don't do your own research, it will be at your peril. And uh, you know, that's that's what you should be thinking all the time. If I didn't do it, I can't trust it, and that's it. That's the end of the story. Imagine it, think of all the students that are using this nowadays to oh my god. Expert. But even before this came into uh, mainstream. There was stuff like Wikipedia and garbage yeah. like that. Yeah. So, and that's been around for what, like 15, 20 years? I don't know. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, longer, longer even. And so, look at all the, the grads that came out in the past, you know, during that time and compared to the previous generations. Is there a difference? Do you see anything? I, I don't know. I Maybe just said, Len, I just said to my dad, not to cut you off, I just said to my dad, we were talking about like the whole uh, lowered expectations in post secondary institutions. I didn't even think about this, but you're going to have probably, at a time when a lot of the older doctors are retiring here and the boomers are needing new medical professionals, they're going to need them at the same time where they need the most care and the most intensive care uh, for the sort of, you know, moonlight years of their lives, their lives. You're going to have all these lowered standards where these people got, you know, it into, into post-secondary education with a lower bar into postgraduate or, po or graduate education, like, you know, specialized stuff like MDs and whatnot with a lower bar. And then I didn't even think about this, but like you're going to have these people who use GPT for some of their assignments and whatnot along the way. I, I mean, someone pointed out to me, Bitcoin Scribe actually, who, who's been on this show before and on our show, pointed out to me that uh, there's at least a few articles floating around in medical journals where the, uh, the journal article itself actually has a line like, okay, let me try and explain that for you as easily as I can in under 500 words. Like, holy Christ, this is in the journal. So like everyone who works in like peer review or adjacent to peer review knows that peer review is a house of cards. No one's actually reading the journal articles. You're, you're reading your buddy's articles because they read yours. And the whole thing is just a sort of, you it's know, a circle, you know, it's what a, it's it is, a, right? it's a, it's a credential, you know, an, an orgy of, of credentialized nonsense. And, and now you add to it. <laughs> chat gpt like are you kidding me so like presumably the best way to view this would be think of the loop right the input is the bad articles that all the friends read for each other they use it to get uh, to get gpt to produce a summary of something it goes back into another article that no one reads and then goes back into the learning model it's just like it, len in 20 years no one's going to remember how to like build ikea furniture it'll just be all you know, gone to GPT hell by then. It's a mess. It's a total mess. I don't want this to continue, but it's actually accelerating. So yeah, it is. In this yeah. in, in this regard, it certainly is. Yeah. Yeah. Joy, yeah. this has been a good one. Trump yeah, it was good. Be speaking soon, I think. It was a right? good rep. Yeah, let's get out of here. Take care of yourselves. Don't cause any trouble. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Take care.